name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, this is just kind of a follow-up video that I did uh, to the previous one about the clergy that we see rising up and speaking truth and um, teaching about prophecy in the church and reading from authentic apparitions. Um, something that I wanted to point out was that in the, in the video that I saw, I think it was Joan of Arc Media that posted it, that came through and I watched it, it was with Father Ripperger. And he spoke about um, the King of France was supposed to consecrate France to the sacred heart of Jesus and, and he didn't. And then it was a, you know, a period of time before everything started kind of going south in France. But that was one of the things that I wanted to point out in the prior video that I actually forgot to was that, and I, again, I don't find it ironic. I don't believe in just chance. You know, we just, we just finished a series on authentic prophets in the church prophesying about a French monarch king and a holy pope that leads to a period of peace in a, um, how do you say, a triumphant church. So the thing that I wanted to point out, two main things, uh, first off, would be that if Father Ripperger is right in his um, assessment that had the French king at the time consecrated France to the Sacred Heart, we may have not have seen the French Revolution, which led to Marxism and you know the whole rise of Masonry and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then kind of, I kind of followed that up with Fatima, and it really it really points to Our Lady exactly what she said. She said, "If my requests are not heeded, the Holy Father will have much to suffer." And it was the Holy Father that was to uh, consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and it wasn't done. It wasn't done when she requested it, and it took a long time, but. It was in the line of kings of France that ultimately paid the price for the lack of consecration. And in the same way, Our Lady is saying that if her requests are not done, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, which would tell us that she wasn't speaking, you know, if we're gonna follow in the same uh, line of thinking that Father Ripperger was talking about, then it wasn't the Holy Father back then, it's the Holy Father later, okay? So again, how, how he, the way he explained that it covers a period of time, but ultimately it's the one that was supposed to do, or the one that holds the office, that was supposed to do the thing that ultimately pays the price later. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out was that in that uh, talk that Father Ripperger did, and he pointed out so very well, even historically, how that wasn't done, um, it was the king of France that didn't consecrate France to the sacred heart of Jesus. If so, but do you realize it? So we're looking at, he, he was looking at a specific mystic, a specific prophet in the Catholic church that told the king he was supposed to do this. But I, here's the question. This is what I'm wondering is if we're going to look at this mystic that told this king he was supposed to consecrate France, right? Then, and then we have Father Chris Aylar taking our Lady of Good Success and speaking about Freemasonry and the Freemasonry in, in, in the world and its effect on the world that it's having now, um, why wouldn't we also take uh, just as seriously the authentic Catholic prophets that we used in the the series on the end times that I did and the triumph of the church leading to a period of peace? And um, so if we, if we are to take the first mystics that Father Ripperger was speaking of uh, seriously, you know, maybe start listening. And then, you know, with Father Chris Aylar doing his talk that he did on Freemasonry and bringing in Our Lady of Good Success and a number of other talks that he's done with uh, Our Lady of Ukraine and things of that nature. Again, if, if we take that with the same value, um, take these mystics that we used or that I used uh, in this uh, presentation on the end times in the era of peace, we should take them just as seriously too. And if we do that, do you realize what happens is we come full circle because it actually ultimately comes back to France and the rise of a monarch king, a French monarch king that restores Christendom, fights for the church, inevitably winning, and the church uh, uh, is triumphant, which is basically the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary or the event of divine mercy. Um, so these, again, these are all tied together. Um, one of the things that I pointed out in the writings that I sent to Father Seraphim is that Jesus told St. Faustina that the world will not have peace until it turns with trust to his mercy. Now, again, remember within the context of the diary, 
turning to Jesus in trust is Eucharistic centered. Okay, but to think that Jesus and Mary would speak of peace in a, in a different way or with a different meaning is, I think, theologically, in my opinion, absurd. Um, so basically what Jesus was telling Faustina is that we will not have the promise of Fatima until we turn with trust to his mercy, okay, to the Eucharist. That, in fact, when the world does that, because we know the world is promised a period of peace, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. We know the ending. Um, that, in fact, would be a Eucharistic reign in which everyone in the world is converted to Catholicism and approaches Jesus in trust, bringing about the period of peace. So anyway, I kind of wanted to point that out in this video, um, that if we follow in the line uh, of thinking that Father Ripperger was talking about, and I, I have the utmost respect for Father Ripperger. Um, I think he's a spiritual man, and I think he's, he's uh, uh, very studied and learned. Um, very well respected, as well as Father Chris. But it's, it's, again, it's like a big puzzle, and it doesn't really start making sense until you start pulling these authentic mystics and prophets and messages from the church and then applying it um, them to each other. And so what, I, what we're looking at here is that Marie Julie Jehenny, St. Hildegard, um, and Catherine Emmerich, with the rise of a monarch king and a holy pope actually would be the end, the, the last piece to that puzzle that kind of puts the whole thing together um, and gives us a little bit more detail of the full picture. And so um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. If it, if it in fact, we're gonna take those seriously and we're gonna take Our Lady of Good Success seriously, we should take these other prophets just as serious. And um, when we do that, the whole thing comes back full circle back to France. And so, Anyway, I wanted to point that out. The other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, staying focused. And that really has to do with the thumbnail that I put on this. And very often what can happen is we can, we can begin to focus on the storm around us and, and lose sight of the prize, okay? Kind of like when Peter was walking on water and he noticed the storm, took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. And so the idea is to trust the Lord in such a way and trust divine providence in such a way that we walk through this in, in peace and in power, okay? So as we go through the storm, we should be actually gaining power and gaining strength. And the way to do that, the only way to do that is to keep our eyes focused on Christ and our hearts centered on the prize, which is the crown of everlasting life. And so, um, don't let the storm get to you. You know, we, we, it's like I said, the Lord wants us to live. He wants us to experience him in the here and in the now. And uh, the way to do that, it, it has to be Eucharistic centered. We have to come before the Lord um, in all humility and, and receive the Eucharist uh, in a way that is worthy of God and to stand in awe of God. You know, the fact that the storm's going on around us and the way that we see it and these things are all coming together should bring us to a, a place to where we're actually rejoicing because we're seeing the fulfillment of what the Lord spoke of and what Our Lady spoke of so long ago actually coming to fulfillment, which is a confirmation of their words, the confirmation and an affirmation of the authenticity of these messages. Um, you know, uh, Divine Mercy, Fatima, Our Lady of Good Success, um, going all the way back to the Gospel and, and the Old Testament prophets. And that should give us pause. It should, it should make us stand in awe of God and his plan that he has for his holy ones. Um, that is us, the church, and, and his priests. And so, um, again, I'm going to recommend daily, call upon the Holy Spirit. You know, um, ask Jesus to anoint you in the Holy Spirit, in power and in truth. And uh, the, the gifts we receive at baptism and confirmation are activated in a way that it is now the spirit operating through us um, and no longer us trying to walk by ourselves. And so it's a very, very important thing to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes these things can get us down. Um, if I were to share a little bit of wisdom that, that I learned, um, not so much directly from uh, Father Nesbitt, but 
in, in, in a way that he spoke it to me, but in just watching him and how he approaches his faith is that everything that we go through, there is something to be learned. There is something that, that we're being taught by God. And um, in the same way that the scriptures kind of refer, you know, God, the Lord says in the Old Testament, you know, could a mother abandon her child? And so it's this constant teaching and, and it's really a way to go through life and try to understand as we go through these things or after we get through them, um, what did I learn from it? What was God trying to teach me through it? And if, we're, if we do that, then we come through the, not only go through those things, but actually as we move through them and come out the other end, we, we continue to walk in that, um, in that train of thought and in that internal prayer that is constantly going on. What was God trying to show me through this? What was God teaching me through this? Um, you know, where was he present? Um, there's all, G Jesus, the Lord, our Father in heaven is always teaching us. And it's so important to, to do that. And um, it's one of the things that I learned from a, from a very good priest and a very good friend is just how he approached his life. And, and so things that would come up or things he would go through, I, I, I know him well enough to know that he walks through life thinking about this constantly. It's a, con it's a contemplative type of prayer. And when we do that, we're doing what Paul commanded us to do, and that's to pray without ceasing. And so sometimes prayer isn't words that we are speaking to God. Sometimes prayer is contemplating um, on, on God's presence and what he was trying to show us in the very experience that we went through. And so wisdom is something that, that comes over time. And it's, it's to know what to do with knowledge that's given. And we've been given knowledge. We understand the teaching of the church. You know, we understand our faith. And we, so we pick up all this knowledge. The question is what to do with it. And the way to come to that conclusion is, is through experience, through trial and error, and, um, and, and through contemplative prayer in what was the Lord trying to teach me through this uh, adversity that I went through, or this, um, this storm I went through, or even through this grace or um, ecstasy that I experienced. What was the Lord trying to teach me, and how can I learn from it and move forward um, in, in, with that understanding and with that knowledge? And so that's really where wisdom comes in because if we're always learning, if God is always trying to teach us something, wisdom in that uh, sense, okay, or in that experience, in this, uh, how do I say, um, in this uh, vein of thought, okay, in this area of our lives, wisdom would be to, to go through it and come out the other end, but don't stop when you come out, okay? So the, the wisdom starts with the contemplation on what was God trying to teach me through it. And then picking up the, uh, you know, the bits and pieces of knowledge that we were being instructed uh, through the experience and then applying that to our lives. And, um, you know, that, that inevitably will lead to some type of ministry and, um, and a building up of the church. And so, Anyway, I wanted to make this video real quick just to, to kind of kind of give a different uh, view, if you will, or approach this whole thing from a different um, angle, if you will. And I'm referring to what we see going on in the world. What is the Lord trying to teach us through this? Because, you know, we're picking up information, positive information from a lot of the clergy now. We're picking up a lot of information um, negative information from the world and politics and you know things that we see happening but the question is what are we going to do with that information and so very often what can happen is the negative information can overwhelm us and and we become you know uh, off balance or off, off uh, kilter you know we trip we fall we stumble and there's nothing wrong with that we can get back up but the idea is to, to not focus so much on the negative um, to the point to where we miss the positive because if we don't listen to the positive then we're not hearing God and that is um, inevitably the most important thing is to hear God's voice in our life and then to apply what we've learned um, to our lives as we as we move forward contemplating those things so that's really in, in that case and in that area that would be wisdom 
because we're picking up the knowledge now from all over the place, you know, um, bits and details of this and that and the other. The idea is to try to not only understand the knowledge that's coming in, but then to apply wisdom afterwards. And to apply wisdom is to contemplate what was God showing me through this? What have I learned from this? And how do I apply this to my life? That is something that happens on the interior. And so God speaks to every single person um, in, in a very individual way. And so it, it kind of, uh, it's different for everyone. But the idea is to try and understand um, how is God speaking to me? And then to focus and hone in on that voice with laser precision. So uh, anyway, I hope this video was helpful in the sense, like I said, it looks like you know some of these pieces are coming together and also you know just with a little bit of instruction and things that I've learned. You know, I don't, I don't really try to teach anything that I haven't learned. I'm still learning wisdom. That will be something that is ongoing for me for a long time because I have a lot of information and sometimes I have no idea what to do with it. Um, so again, it's just a, I'm passing on something that I've learned through observation of, of a man that I know is a man of God and of strong faith and um, will go through this in absolute peace because he has not taken his eye off the prize. And that's the idea. We know how it ends. We know where this goes. And in the end, what I can tell you beyond a reasonable doubt is that those who remain faithful will be more victorious in a, in a way that you cannot even possibly imagine. And so let's stay focused and keep our eyes and our hearts and our souls and our minds on the prize. And that is the crown of everlasting life for those who love God. And to love God is to keep his commandments and to love our neighbor. May God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may he grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.